Hey guys, this week we're talking about hypertrophy. Uh, this is going to be a three-part series, so get ready. My goal is to provide you guys with you know, the best source for the topic of hypertrophy that I can see out there in the internet land. So hopefully I've done that. But uh, anyway, without further ado, let's get started. All right, this week you're going to learn about the physiology of skeletal muscle. Uh, we're going to do an overview of skeletal muscle. We'll do muscle fiber types, breakdown of muscle fibers, and then muscle fiber growth. All right. For the overview of skeletal muscle, most of you are probably already know this, but for all that don't, let's, um, let's go over it. Skeletal muscle is used for movement. That's the primary cause, you know, and that's what most of us think about when we think about muscle. It's what helps us lift weights. It's what helps us run down the track. It's what helps us jump out of the gym. And so as you can see, I have a little image here that shows how it works. Muscle causes movement by pulling. It's always going to be pulling. And then what's going to happen is it's going to start, originate, at a certain bone and it's going to attach to a distal bone and it's going to pull that bone closer to where it originates that's that's as simple as i can put it this is the bicep i feel like i always use the bicep as the example as you can see the bicep crosses over the elbow and then it flexes the arm up to it and that's how we make those giant muscles we all like to show off so much um it's also used for posture i mean that's what keeps us upright no, it's going to be the muscle in conjunction with the skeletal system, of course. Joint stability, heat, you know, when we shiver, that's the body's way of, of getting us warm. It allows us to speak and chew. Maybe that's one that you didn't think about. But if we didn't have muscle, we could not chew our food. Uh, we could not speak. I could not be telling you guys about muscle right now. Muscles grow 5 to 20% in the first few months. That's where we all hear about the newbie gains. And then that's where the rubber meets the road. And you actually have to know what you're doing to get those hard-earned gains we all like to talk about and show off on Instagram. Muscle growth isn't symmetrical throughout the entire muscle. Instead, it varies. It could be, you know, proximally, distally, medially. But it just the, the bottom line is if I do curls, my biceps, and my biceps, I'm lumping them all in there, they're going to grow different regionally depending on probably the type of exercise we use which is you know one of the reasons why you should probably not use the same exact um exercise every single time that's a variety it's, it's a good um good reason why we should use different exercises so the motor unit is an individual alpha motor neuron all, all the muscle fibers that it innervates um high threshold motor units that's where the alpha neurons that innervates 300 to possibly thousands of myofibers. And then the low threshold motor units, they innervate 10 to 100 myofibers. It's like the ones that we normally use just walking around. Uh, the high threshold motor units, I mean, some of us might go our whole life and never use them. Unless we do something of maximal effort, then you probably don't call on them very often unless you like wreck your car, freak out, and lift your car off of your grandma. So. Entire muscles surrounded by the epimesium, uh, and eventually the paramecium, epimesium, endomesium, they're all going to end up at the tendon, but it's just the surrounding collagen layers. So muscle fibers are grouped into bundles of 100 to 200 um, muscle fibers called fascicles, and they're surrounded by the paramecium. The endomesium, this is where it starts to get a little bit um, important for you to be listening. The endomesium surrounds each muscle fiber and plays a vital role in lateral force transmission. Probably happens through the costumers. And you're going to hear me say probably a lot today. And it's because that's where science is. So when there's something definite, then I'll let you know. But uh, right now, for the majority of, well, the majority of science, it's a probably, it's a, a depends. You're going to hear a lot of answers like that, but that's just the bottom line. So, uh, Costumers, they're located on the Z lines and M lines of myofilaments. That's the actin and myosin that we'll talk about a little bit later. They maintain structural integrity of the sarcolemma. 
and orchestrating mechanically related signaling. The Casimirs are thought to be the pathway for lateral force transmission from the sarcomeres to the endomysium. And we'll wrap up the overview now, but each muscle fiber consists of thousands of myofibrils. Myofibrils are encircled by T-tubules, sarcoplasmic reticulum, and terminal cisternae. Now that's called the, the triad, and that's where that's where the, the the calcium finds its way. The calcium ions finds its way into the muscle, and that's what really causes um, movement. So the terminal cisternae. It's contained, they contain the calcium ions, which are responsible for the initiation of muscle contraction. When these calcium ions are pumped into the cytosol or the, sar or the sarcoplasm, that's what causes the muscle. And we're going to get deeper into that in just a little bit when we talk about the sliding filament theory. But finally, myofibrils contain bundles of myofilaments. Myofilaments are protein filaments, such as actin, myosin, titan, and maybe nebulin primarily. And the bundles is... is Each of these bundles is defined as a sarcomere, with each myofibril containing 10,000 plus sarcomeres. Muscle fiber types. Now, this is, I'm going to go ahead and give Dr. Andy Galpin a big shout out here because he is one of the leading researchers out there, is doing tons of work on fiber type. And so, now, most of the time when exercise scientists like myself talk about uh, muscle fiber types. They're going to say type 1, which is oxidative in nature. That's the muscles we use to run a marathon. That's the muscles we use to walk around the house. It's the muscles we use to, to sit up in bed. Um, the type 2A fibers, they're going to be fast oxidative glycolytic fibers. <clears throat> Those are somewhere in between. They're going to use oxygen. They're also going to use a lot of you know, the glycolytic system. And think about f soccer players. I feel like they're the perfect um, athlete that uses a majority of type 2a fibers type 2x when you, when you talk about that that's fast glycolytic fibers those are the fastest think about throwers think about sprinters think about any weightlifters anyone who moves really fast for a short period of time however there's also combinations of each of these as you can see over here you know shout out to invictus they uh, did a little clinic with Andy, and this is one of the images that they created, but as you can see, there's mixtures of all of those, so, you know, it's just a way of giving you guys an idea, but there's forms of all of those, uh, primarily determined by the amount of ATPase, which is the, um, it's found in the myosin head, and that is and that's the enzyme um, that's in the myosin head that we're going to talk about a little bit more later, but that's how they, ATP is broken down into ADP and a phosphogen ion. So, in or, sorry, phosphogen inorganic ion. So, we will go into this a bit deeper, just a little bit, so stay tuned for more for that. Muscle fiber breakdown. So, now, here's what happens when during the when we think about movement especially where it pertains to skeletal muscle we think about the sliding filament theory but it's that's not all that happens so i'm going to try to give you guys the full like of what happens not just the sliding filament theory not just action potentials you know the neuromuscular junction i want to put it all together for you because i know when i was just getting back into school and learning about the sliding filament theory, it just all seemed so complicated. And I always wanted there to be a place to where I could just understand it from the beginning to end. So I'm hoping I do that right here. So anyway, an action potential arrives at the neuromuscular junction. That's down here in this little square. That, that allows acetylcholine to diffuse across the synaptic cleft and binds to the acetylcholine receptors on the muscle fiber, resulting in depolarization of the sarcolemma. That's when, boom, we're going to get some movement. The action potential spreads throughout the muscle fibers via T-tubules, opening up the calcium channels, channels of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, resulting in the influx of calcium into the sarcoplasm. What does that do? The calcium then binds to troponin C, 
causing movement of the tropomy tropomycin away from the actin binding sites, and that allows myosin to grab it. So then the high energy ADP myosin molecules now interact with the actin forming cross bridges. Energy is released in a power stroke, leaving ADP and phosphate ions um, to disassociate with from the myosin head. Now, new AD ATP binds to the myosin. The cross bridge is broken. The myosin head hydrolyzes ATP to ADP in the phosphate ion, and then the energy released returns the myosin head to its original position. ATPase is the enzyme I told you about earlier, and that's the, the, that really determines the speed of a muscle fiber. A lot of times when people like Dr. Galpin is classifying muscle fibers as fast, slow, whatever, that's what they're looking at. So my, um, the myosin head hydrolyzes ADP, and then the energy released returns the myosin head to its original position. Then steps four and seven are repeated as long as calcium ions are present in the sarcoplasm. The balance between muscle protein breakdown and muscle protein synthesis is the determining factor of hypertrophy. So a lot of times you'll you'll hear people you know just talk about muscle protein synthesis. Oh, we had two hundred percent muscle protein synthesis. That's great, but how much muscle protein breakdown did you get? Because if you had two hundred and ten percent of muscle protein breakdown, then nothing happened other than you got smaller. Satellite cells are the most abundant skeletal muscle stem cells. That's um, they, they contribute to the maintenance of muscle mass regeneration and and hypertrophy. A significant gap that exists in our knowledge of what of how they're actually related to repair and regeneration. So, but it's important to, to know where they are. And to, as you can see in the little chart up here, you know they lie right on top around the sarcolemma. So. How they relate to hypertrophy and eh, still being determined. Muscle fiber growth. Muscle fibers consist of 75% water and 25% protein filaments. Of that, 25%, 15% is myofibular, consisting of actin, myosin, titan, and a few other protein filaments. 5% of the proteins are found in the sarcoplasm. 40% of the proteins are for metabolism and 10% are for contraction. Of the contractile proteins, 50% are for myosin, 20% actin, 10% titan. And like, just want to, I can't, I cannot uh, emphasize enough how important titan is because of, because of its importance to structure and its resistance to stretch. When we talk about being elastic and you talk about people you know, jumping higher, talking about people getting faster, Titan is a big proponent, is a big cause of those things happening. Uh, 5% is nebulin, troponin, uh, tropomycin, and 5% is, is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Yeah, and like I said, elasticity, Titan is a big uh, component. So is nebulin, but we just don't know quite as much just yet. Uh, along with endomysium and other connective tissue that contributes as well. Muscle fibers grow by stacking sarcomeres in series or parallel. As you can see here, you know, we can either put them end to end or we can put them side by side and they get thicker. Now, someone might, you know, be wondering how can you go end to end? Wouldn't the muscle itself get longer? That's not the case. Here's what happens. When, when and if the muscles are stacking the sarcomeres in series, what happens is a change in panation angle, anywhere from 7 to 14%. Now, obviously, if that angle changes, as you can see in the little picture, and this is also taken straight from Andy Galpin, then I can fit more and more, and yet it doesn't change the actual length of the bicep itself. So that's how it could happen. But once again, the truth is the science still don't know exactly how the muscle fibers grow, but we're pretty sure it's either in series or side by side. You know, in parallel. Um, the hypothesis that makes the most sense is that sarcomeres are stacked in parallel, causing the myofibrils to grow in thickness, leading to muscle fibers uh, to also grow. Uh, sarcoplasmic hypertrophy is also a part of the muscle growth process, which is the muscle that uh, the sarcoplasmic growth doesn't really help when it comes to contraction. So, so I'm going to do a whole lot to get you stronger. 
Sarcoplasmic hypertrophies in reference to the mitochondria, sarcoplasmic reticulum, fluid in the cell, connective tissue, and all the other non contractile elements. Dr. Galvin has a theory that maybe bodybuilding with lightweight for high reps of failure might add more sarcoplasmic hypertrophy or non functional is another word for that. The other side of the coin, though, is powerlifters and weightlifters probably experience more myofibrillar hypertrophy, which is the stuff that works. So is it true that bodybuilders are all show and no go? I don't know. I was a powerlifter and a weightlifter, so I'm biased. So <laughs> anyway, Roberts et al. 2020 discovered that an increase in non-contractile elements, especially fluid, probably happens first, allowing for myofibrillar uh, hypertrophy to then happen later. So now there's more space, and so now you can grow, you know, more proteins you know, obviously if there's no room you can't there's nowhere for the you know to add more protein regardless both sarcoplasmic and myofibular hypertrophy are both taking place however the peers that going heavy probably leads to more myofibular hypertrophy in conclusion <laughs> this is going to be funny but the type of hypertrophy that you want to elicit will depend on the sport you play your personal genetics and the types of improvement you need in the coming series we're going to teach you how to use gymwear rs and flex units to ensure the specific adaptations are the ones you're actually gaining so if you're a basketball player obviously just getting jacked isn't going to help mj probably didn't lift like johnny o jackson here or me up there. This is my way of saying I competed against this guy, Johnny O. Jackson, who's an amazing dude and incredible professional bodybuilder, but he also powerlifted. Obviously, he's slightly more jacked than me, but I still outlifted him. So, you know, all show, no go. I don't know. He's pretty, he's pretty go too. So, anyway, I hope that answers your questions. Uh, if you have any questions, email me at travis at gymaware.com. I hope that this gives you a good base of knowledge for what we're about to learn in the coming weeks of how to actually use this information.